Hey, this is Nate Wells. And this is Drew Cove. Check out our podcast, that Go for Hockey podcast, for uh, the latest news and updates on University of Minnesota hockey. You can find us on uh, iTunes, and we're also on the uh, Zone Coverage Podcast Network. That's elite. The Zone Coverage Podcast Network. They may be drinkers, Robin, but they're also human beings. Hell yeah, let's get Stinko. podcast back in the cupboard under the stairs studio <laughs> i am your host giles farrell not with me today is ben remington he will be joining us in progress uh as uh he is on special assignment to begin this otherwise fine podcast uh joining me in studio is the master and commander, I was going to say master producer, but that's Eric, who is he's in studio taking the us. wheel. Yeah, he's he's here with us as well. Hi. But the commander of zone no coverage, one heard that. yeah, that is the lovely voice of Tom Schreier. Yeah, you may remember him from such Giles and the Goalie podcast as <laughs> the one where Mike Yo was fired. <laughs> was that from the Blues or from the the Wild? Both. <laughs> uh, and then uh, on the. Uh, Giles in the goalie hotline with us is special guest, uh, our friend uh, Tony Abbott of The Athletic, who we, I believe we reference at least twice every podcast now. Tony, how's it going? Oh, Sounded he's, a bit like Ben. Yeah, he's filling in for Ben. Or Elmo. I mean, <laughs> he had the... He had the yawn just prior to us starting. He, he so did. I was a little. I was a little worried just, just to take the people behind the scenes because I think they deserve it. They're, they're great <laughs> just, listeners. I, I, I am... If Tony if Tony yawns, <laughs> I'm either gonna drive up and strangle him, or I'm gonna strangle him when he moves to the cities. I really just have to look at gas and costs, you know, kind of cost benefit analysis. Yeah, what's cost effective? It will happen if he does yawn, because him him and Ben, goodness Ben, half the half the time. I assume when he when you're talking, he's not. He's just napping. That's yeah. Anyway. I just wanted to uh, make a seamless transition to a. Uh, to a very brief, abbreviated <laughs> post Ben era of this show. So I, I, I didn't want anyone to miss Ben out there. Ben will be arriving soon. But in the meantime, you know, like I'm going to steal his catchphrases. I'm going to say things like, uh, oh, uh, I ate a uh, pulled pork taco the other day. And it was really good. Yikes. I had a lot of coleslaw on it. Yeah, yikes, yikes. I mean, just terrible things to say on a podcast. Um <laughs> Do you have any gripes just uh, before we get started? And we, we obviously have a game which the entire wild team slept through to talk about. But do you have any gripes with uh, with the game day experience with the wild? Do you uh, do you do you want to just bash on some fans? I mean, what, what, what do we got from the uh, the Ben categories here? Well, let me tell you something about jerseys. <laughs> the Ducks one. It's not good. Oh no! I think we need to talk about this dumpster game. Oh. So it'll be Web better than anything. That's... Like, what's that Web D doing there? Oh yikes! That's yikes. That's that's fair. I mean, it's it's terrible. Do I'm you... helping '90s jerseys though. Like, awesome! I love them so much. I want to marry a '90s jersey someday. <laughs> this is the worst. This I is the am worst way of podcast. Ben unintentionally, I, I meant I'm to now, be a tribute to Ben, but I think it's parody. I, I'm so sorry. I love no, Ben so much. That was a good parody, and I'm now <laughs> regretting my life choices of not marrying a '90s jersey. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! I hope it would Jamie, have to be Wild Wing, right? I hope. Yeah, I hope Jamie doesn't listen to this podcast. Uh, <laughs> all right, I have many grievances to air, and they're all Minnesota Wild related. So we're gonna transition right into that um just ever so quickly just to recap the last week for the minnesota wild before we just vent at large here um they played what is that one two three home games this week uh they played the flyers that was on tuesday a five to four loss in regulation the wild were up i think it was what three to one four to one three one after one yeah that's right luke cunning scored twice Tony, you're big on Luke Cunning right now. 
Yeah, I mean, like, I, I, I think the big thing is that he's someone who's scoring and getting points right now, which is something that, like, you know, just as an analyst, I believe that the Wild could use more of. So, no, 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 um, no, 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 no. Eric Snack, <laughs> if you have a problem with Eric Snack, I have a problem with you. No, what you have to do <laughs> is take... What's problem with Eric Snack? What you He's ha- good again. I mean, he they is. draft a defenseman that doesn't score, a center yeah. that doesn't score. Uh, what you have to do now that <laughs> Luke Cunning has shown he can score is you have to trade him for a center because you need more centers and a center who cannot skate. Yeah, a slow one. Yeah. By the way, how do you like the, the last two general managers of the Wild? And we're going to start with grievances right away. Um, <laughs> Chuck Fletcher trades for a defenseman that can't skate, right? Cam Barker. That was a sign like, yeah, because this guy's not going to do well. And then <laughs> and then, and then, then our, our buddy Fenton here trades Nino Niederreiter, who I get, and I think it's very likely, and I know, Tony, you're a big Nino guy, but I think if you look at the Islanders, they thought this guy was going to be part of the solution there disappointing although i guess he was disappointed as a teenager so whatever but ends up a great trade for the wild to acquire him and then i think we saw here that i guess fenton looks at it and he goes well i'm spending a million dollars less on my fourth line forward or whatever but i think he may end up being like part of the catalyst for carolina and then they'll get sick of him and he may be a guy that every three years gets traded because he just kind of seems to to give you his best impression right away or his best play right away. But either way, really bad trade. And it just seems too much like the Camp Barker trade where you traded for a player that just literally cannot keep up with other hockey players in the NHL, which is a bummer. Yeah, it's a huge bummer, especially since, you know, you you look at what he's done in Carolina. I think he's got eight goals in 13 games so far. And a lot of people uh, that like I see who are like still kind of like defend. I don't think you can straight up defend the trade. Anymore, I know there were people trying to straight up defend that trade. Right, very hard. After now. Very, very hard. hard. Yes. Like I, I, I could not believe it. Uh, but I, I think, uh, I think that sort of gone to like it, there's that caveat, right? Like, oh, he's doing well playing with Sebastian Aho, and I'm like, dude, this is the guy who made Jason Pominville look like he was. Uh, look, look like he, I mean, like he was, he was good, but I mean, he made him look like he was Sidney Crosby. Like we, we've known all along that if you put Nino Niederreiter with good players, like he can do well. Like, come on, what have, what have we really learned here? Carolina, by the way, it's not just him who's doing well. Eight, two, and zero oh in their last ten. They have sixty-eight points, and there's three teams with sixty-nine. Columbus, nice. yeah, it had to happen. <laughs> uh, you know, Columbus, Montreal, Pittsburgh. So I mean, they're in it, and the Wild, on the other hand somehow are kind of i mean this is to be fair kind of their mo um recently but kind of falling back into that wild card seed and even though they've lost you know what it's like six the last seven games they still are hanging in there because the the bottom half of the division as they were saying on the the nbc broadcast i mean the the vancouver's the arizona's of the world that are right behind them aren't great teams but you got to imagine like a colorado chicago could you know nab those those seeds if the wild continue this trend. Thank you. It is, it is truly amazing. Just like how you can just draw the line of, uh, of where the wild just like totally fell off a cliff to that Nino Niederreiter trade too. like immediately they go out and then they fall on their face to, uh, to Anaheim. I think they did win like what three games heading into the all-star break. But after that, just like, Oh my God, it's been so, it's been so bad. And you know, I, I, I think it's that, I think it's that sweet Swiss smile that's just gone from the locker room and went to Carolina. It's doing real nice in Raleigh. Uh, yeah, that's my uh, that's my that hashtag good, analysis. There. That good hockey boy smile. I think I think there's some truth. We didn't even talk about the Blues game. Do you want to briefly recap this well, dumpster was, fire of a game? I was going to recap the Wild the, then played after the Tuesday game on Friday. They played New Jersey. Yeah. And again, the Wild go up. They were up four to one in the hockey game. They lose five to four in overtime. Copy paste, basically. Yep. And then yep. It come to Sunday, the Wild getting a red hot St. Louis Blues team who had won nine in a row coming in. And the Wild absolutely just crapped down their pants at, uh, for yeah, nothing at home. Yeah. at home to the Blues. So there you go. There's your week in review. A. I- Garbage week. I just I think it I think we should add context there because it's easy after a game like this on national television at home, um, 
against a team that previously I think people thought wasn't very good um, to overreact to that. But this is a trend we're, we're seeing. And I think, I think part of it, and, and Tony, you put together this list of players that the Wild could trade. You, you look at the top few names, and at one point maybe seemed untouchable, a Jared Spurgeon, a, a Mikhail Granlin. I mean, we've talked to, you know, Eric Stahl, obviously, in a 42-goal season, you don't want to trade him. Charlie Coyle, I guess, has been thrown around a little bit, and you go down the list. But I think any of these guys feel like they could be dealt because if a guy like Niederreiter with his upside, regardless of how bad that trade was, and, and again, I'd feel differently if Victor Rass was any good, if it just was simply <laughs> that that you know, Niederreiter was better than him. But at Victor Rask, I think you look across the league, I mean, I don't know how many would be rolling him out every night, right? So I, I think – it's just a message sent that this core is gone. And I think the direction I'm going with this is as scary as it is. And, and Ben wrote on our site about how, whether or not you can trust Fenton. And to be honest, it's probably a resounding no right now, at least among the fan base, but he is the guy in charge. They're not going to get rid of him. He He's going to see if he, it's not a tweak. He's probably going to go through a trade, anything of value to shake up the core uh, outside of the guys like Zucker who are on long-term contracts, as Tony, you mentioned, and um, these younger guys, which it just seems ridiculous to me to, to deal a green way with his upside. Uh, anyone, anyone but Erickson X, so the, the Cunnins of the world, I don't think you touch those guys. But other than that, I feel like everyone's on the block right now. I will say in defense of Fenton in, in terms of like, okay, like can you trust – Fenton after the uh, the Nino Niederreiter for Ras trade and I and I think you touched it on it a little bit when you talked about Chuck Fletcher in his first year trying to uh, to shake things up with the Cam Barker trade and, and not doing very well with that. I think what Fenton learned and, and and maybe this is just me rationalizing this right, like hoping that he learned some lesson out of this and that this is not just like three inches away from just collapsing and, and leaving Minnesota as a crater in the state of hockey for 10 years. Um, but <laughs> what I hope he took away from that is that you are not going to get like, like the, the idea that you are going to find this hockey trade that you're going to solve all of your problems with, like that's not going to happen, at least not from a position of weakness which Minnesota is like, you know, like everyone knows that Minnesota needs this super talented superstar. And I, I don't think that you're going to, you know, be able to like even dangle someone very, very good, like Jared Spurgeon. Like, I don't think you're going to get like the guy that you're looking for that dynamic forward. That's already in the NHL for Spurgeon, because you know, who's giving that up? Like who's, who's giving that? Like, I don't know if anybody's doing that, you know, uh, Taylor Hall for Adam Larson isn't going to happen here, even though uh, Jared Spurgeon is obviously way better than Adam Larson. Um, so I think what you got to do is you got to pick one of two directions, right? You got to you got to either uh, sell futures and get top quality talent, to, and that just completely blew up with uh, uh, Miko Koivu's ACL. Like at at that moment, I was just like, ah, he, you can't really justify buying especially with the goaltending that you've had. And I'm sure we will get to that later uh, or, or sell for futures. And I think that's exactly what Minnesota needs to do is like anyone of value. Like I'm not that like, cause when, when you're, when you're talking about making trades for futures, like that's different than a hockey trade. There's not really an art necessarily to trading uh, like uh, very good players that are NHL veterans for futures. I, I, I think you just kind of need to get like grab items. Like you need to grab picks. You need to grab prospects and, and you need to obviously execute that. But that's a lot more simple than like, okay, like I have Mikhail Gramlin. How am I going to get Alex Ovechkin? How am I going to get Patrick Line with that? Like, so sorry, I'm rambling. No, it, it, it's no, worth kinda... pointing out just, the last thing I'll ever say about Cam Barker ever, he is only 32 years old, drafted first or third overall in 04. He last played hockey when he was 26 in the 12, 13 season. I mean, I, I get that. That's not true. That's not true. He's a star in the KHL. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Last played NHL hockey. And, and to be fair, I mean, the KHL is there's worse leagues, but uh, um, I would take, I, I'll say this for Cam Barker. I would take him on my roster. If I also got Carol Kaprizov. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you know who else is in the KHL? Send, send him on the same plane. <laughs> um, 
No, and and and, and again, I worry about that as well, um, Kaprasov. That people think that there's just going to be this singular solution. I think what it is is, you know, looking at your list. Um, I think like the top four. I mean, until you get kind of again to those the Greenways and whatnot or Dubnik, I don't think you want to just. As much as he's not been great, I don't think you want to completely just ship away your goaltender. But why um, not? <laughs> you you so I'm sorry. You would trade you would trade Dubnik right now at the yeah. deadline if someone wanted him. Yeah. And then you're rolling out Stalock and the the AHL goalie. <laughs> like it's I just called tanking, know. baby. It. Oh, it's Ben here. Sorry, we got uh, a Giles. Yeah, we got a... In, Giles is indicating to me that. Uh, yeah. That Ben is here. I feel like this is the right time actually Elvis for Ben is in to the jump building. In. Yeah, because we're about to transition into goaltending. So naturally, that's when he hits the alert that he is here. Um, <laughs> but let's uh, let's I, let's hold on to that for a second. Hold on to that thought. Outside of that, I mean, I think I think it's not necessarily that one of these guys is going to return. Even like, I mean, you maybe get lucky with the prospect, and you know, he really, really, really develops well. I think it's more that you're just changing the culture of the team, the look of the team. I mean, you're doing a makeover because that's, I'm assuming, what you want out of a new GM. Again, I, I'm not Leopold, and I know he said the, the whole tweak thing, but I think if he watches the team this year, I think the goal right now is just to change the culture and hope that a kind of mass shift in roster results in in more than just kind of a first round exit over and over again. When he got the he gave the green light to make said changes. He does watch the games. I mean, yeah. I'm sure he's sick of this. I I mean, you've lost what? No, it's it's got to be a, it's either 15 or 16 out of like 30 home games this year. That's that's not hashtag our ice. Well, it's also I think it's worth pointing out that they're going to continue to tell you that they've made the playoffs X many years in a row. This is a little like the attendance thing where it's like, don't get too caught in that. Cause I think it was the Oh nine season. They said they were still selling out. Right. And that was the year you should have just cratered and seen if you got a top three pick. I think with this, don't hold on to this thing because people compare this to March madness, right? If you want to use that comparison and say, well, a hot team can just run through the playoffs. All you need is a hot goalie. You're not Duke or Kansas or, you know, Michigan State or whatever, right? University of Kentucky. You're Florida Gulf Coast. You're one of those teams that you're like, you're like, hey, we're in the tournament, baby. We can upset somebody. I, I, we could that's be. what the wild is. But if you're the 16th best team, you're not a good team. We and could you can be still make VCU. The we could be VCU. You and could make be it VCU, University of Richmond. That's the wild. <laughs> ben, ben, Ben's ben, coming we're, in. We're a college hoops podcast now. Ben, ben <laughs> showed up. He is in a full sweat. He is. Uh, Did you run here? He's looking exhausted. Oh, and I'm going to fire half my employees. I swear <laughs> to God. So, Ben, just while we have you completely upset and oh, yeah. uh, we're rip we, run, ready to yeah. go. We're, we're talking college basketball. We're transitioning. So, what the hell so, did I miss? So, so I'm going to set this up with two things. First of all, the college basketball is that people are saying, like, I'm saying you got to forget, like, who cares about the the playoff streak? Because half yeah. the teams in the NHL make it. It's like I was saying it was like the attendance, um, you know, the attendance streak where they should have just bottomed out the final year, the the streak just to yeah. to get a pick. Um, I was saying that you want to be Duke, Kansas, whatever you want. That's like Pittsburgh, right? Is the, <laughs> the team that's always in it. You don't want to be Florida <laughs> Gulf Coast. That's what the wild are. And. and the other thing is Tony and I, you know, Tony here put together a great list of players you can trade. We're going over the Coils and the Grandlands and even the Spurgeons. He's suggesting Mr. Devin Dubnik could be dealt, and we want to start there Oh, yeah, there it's with entirely him. possible. I'm not saying could. I'm saying I would do it. Like, if somebody wanted Devin Dubnik right now, I would do it because I don't think that it's just a couple of moves away or even a mass shift in roster away from a, a culture change. I, I think you just kind of got to do – the Vegas bit and sell off as many, like, I mean, they didn't sell off as many guys as you can, but like try to get assets in whatever way you can. Like maybe you take on some bad contracts for a couple of years to get assets that way. Uh, Like I, I I think that pretty much anybody on this roster right now, except for Matt Dumba, (laughs) he cannot go. And and I, and I do not think it's the time for Jason Zucker to go, even though like all of wild Twitter just like wants his head on a bike right now. Um, But 
I think for the most part, like I, I, I don't think that there's anyone who should be off the table between now and the draft to uh, right. sell off for as many assets as you can and just let let Fenton build this thing up. But you know who else is safe besides Matt Dumba and should be Jason Zucker? I think I know who you're talking about. It's our friend. Al. Yeah. Uh, so nobody's <laughs> taking on that three year <laughs> no. contract. <laughs> no, they're not. Uh, so I don't know. I, not that I necessarily disagree with Dubnik. It very much depends on the return. Um, but the the thing, the issue that I've had with everyone clamoring for trading Dubnik or getting rid of him or you know sending him to Iowa, cutting him like whatever the Star Tribune comment <laughs> section says today. Uh, I, I think it's really really hard to find decent goaltending in the NHL. I think it's really hard, and so. I think the Wild's best shot, it depends on what you think of their window, too. And, and you know, with Kirill Kaprizov maybe possibly coming in th- two years. That's the window slamming. <laughs> uh, so it, if you want to win any time in the next couple of years, I don't know if they have, they don't, I don't know if they have a goalie that's going to be that guy. I mean, Capo Kakinen got off to a great start in the AHL, but he's been pretty bad lately, actually. So uh, I think their best, the point is, I think their best shot to have a decent or better goaltender is with Devin Dubnik is with him getting better, him playing like we've seen him play through whatever means necessary, perhaps a new goalie coach. Uh, I, I just... I, <laughs> I mean, everything should be on the table at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know, but but that, that's my yeah. point about the goaltending, is that Devin Dubnik is their best shot to have a, a decent or better goaltender because you can't just acquire them. They, they don't just It'd be like trading an ace or something like that. Right, yeah. and they obviously can't afford one. I mean, it depends on what you think of Sergei Bobrovsky and his impending free agency, but... I mean, he's going to cost a fortune, and and goaltenders like that do cost a fortune. They can't afford that. So it it really depends on what you think and what you want this team to do. If you want them to full-on tank mode, then, yeah, trade Dubnik. If you get a good deal for him, like I said, decent goaltenders are hard to find. You should get a decent return on him. Should also be pointed out, Edmonton is in (laughs) always tank mode. (laughs) Gotten all those first-round picks. They didn't. Yeah, but you know what? They've got... They've got a great new GM and Keith Gretzky and outside <laughs> hockey people think he's great. Uh, I, I, he's really the Wayne Gretzky of GMs. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm, and I'm not against the idea of actually bottoming out, bottoming out now. I just don't know how you acquire that high end talent. However, I'm not even sure that that happens in the draft unless you go one, one. And even then yeah, it's not, that's you know, it's not true. guaranteed. I, so he probably shouldn't be off the table. The guys I would not touch, and I've said this, Greenway, Cunning, just because I think I think given their cost controlled, Greenway has shown enough. I also yeah. just his size and all that. Cunning given a first round pick recently. I don't touch Dumba. I I Tony, maybe explain your your process thought process on Zucker because I think you're right. You you compare or you use the uh the Skinner, uh the Jeff Skinner trade as an example of how it could go wrong. Yeah. So, uh, what what are we uh, what are we looking at with Jason Zucker now? He's got fourteen goals. It's it's it uh, and twenty nine points still. I, I don't think he got. Oh, he definitely did not get any points. Boom! Uh, got shut out, obviously. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah. So you're looking at someone like Jason Zucker, and he's making five point five million on uh, or for the next uh, five years. I think he signed over this summer, right? Yep. Like, uh, it was Nino who was signed the year before that. Yep. And what you want to avoid doing with him is you want to avoid doing what you just did to Nino Niederreiter, which is sell him at an absolute low point. And, uh, and pointed to the example of Jeff Skinner, who had the same thing happen to him last year in Carolina. Like Carolina is not incapable of making a dumb trade when it comes to a sniper <laughs> as well. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they took a year with Skinner where he shot for a low shooting percentage, much like Zucker, where his uh, teammates shot for a low shooting percentage, just like Zucker. And they said, oh, you know who's the problem? This guy with like the huge track record of scoring goals. <laughs> and they uh, and they traded him for uh, like a, like probably a B prospect and a couple of like second round picks or something like that, maybe even a second and a third. Like it was not uh, it was not a very substantial package because they sold low on him. And with Zucker, I, I know some people are afraid that his uh, of his no trade clause, which is a 10 team no trade clause that'll kick into effect next year. I know some people are afraid of that, but I, I am more afraid of taking a guy who like has scored 30 goals and, and should be uh, with with any luck 
a consistent 25 goal scoring winger who brings speed. I don't want to give that away for nothing. And if you have four more years of him, even with the no trade clause, I think it's better to just wait, re- let him recoup his value, and then uh, explore moving him in the future. And and that's if at that point you would even want to. I, I think that's not, I mean, do you yeah. guys disagree? No, I, I would agree with that. No. Yeah. So, I, so looking at like a guy like Charlie Coyle, to me, that seems like an obvious one. He is up, his contract's up. He still has a year under year, contract yep. with the Wild, right? So you have a whole year that you could you could supposedly move him. It's not an urgent move. Mm-hmm. But given that this has been a storyline that's been perpetuated over and over again, mm-hmm. given that I don't – I mean, where do you think this is in terms of high-end, low-end? We know it's not high-end, but it's not – It's not. there's there's a lower point to be reached, and you're care, <laughs> you want to be careful that you're not selling him at uh, that point. If, if you're playing it purely on the stock market, maybe you'd deal him because he's played a little bit better recently. But that's again, I, I think there's that. a ceiling to him that's – probably a little bit higher too and that's what's frustrating about him but i'm i'm not for dealing him for a couple of reasons number one uh his handedness uh, which is it's i fair. wrote an article about a couple of weeks ago the wild are starving for right-handed forwards just and look at bubble hockey <laughs> exactly with rod hockey yeah <laughs> and, and so and so coil is is one of the only ones they have it seems like he's the only right-hander right now that's healthy i mean pontus Haberg is hurt uh, also, his contract is, I mean, it's its a decent deal. If, if you got the next year and a half, he's only making $400,000 more than Marcus Foligno, and uh, he's getting a lot more production than that. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not gung-ho to, to deal Charlie Coyle. I, I'm of the mindset with him where if you do come across the right deal, I, I think you go for it. But it depends on what you want to do. If you want to literally get rid of everything, then, yeah, get rid of Charlie Coyle. You can probably get something decent for him. But if you're looking to keep some semblance of a young core around, I don't think he's a bad player to have, especially at the contract that he's on. What do you think, Charles? Um, I think that goaltending is bad. <laughs> and I want to talk more about it. <laughs> because it's bad. And Bruce Boudreau acknowledged that today, post-game. And... This didn't get picked up on the radio because it took Boudreaux a while to get to the podium to speak, but uh, Kevin Faulness tweeted out his post-game audio after, and Bruce Boudreaux pretty much acknowledged what we have been saying on this podcast for a long time. God, it feels good to be vindicated by Bruce. (laughs) He said, and I quote, I think when you play a goalie every night, and then he had a pause, his game starts to go downhill a bit. <laughs> Whoa! So he acknowledged that he's had to play Dubnik night in and night out, and then he, you know, has kind of a passive aggressive jab at Stalock, who's not been a good backup. No. And then he followed that up with trying to, you know, give Stalock some credit. He's like, he's a great guy. Everybody loves him. That's coach speaks for. He sucks. <laughs> He's the got, locker room. Got, yeah, I got money because he's the they lo- like him. Locker room concierge. That's his job. He's he's backup goaltender slash concierge. Three and, more years, just jeez. Three uh, more years on that deal. It's so dumb. You're Alex Stalock. You're like a career 900 goalie or whatever. And like, did they like get video of of him like like just talking to Paul Fenton? He's like, hey, you know where I went to school? And uh, <laughs> and Fenton's like UMD, and he goes. Uh, Alex Stalock's just like, yeah, well, UMD's nuts. And this is like, <laughs> that got on video, and Fenton's like, oh man, like he's gonna leak that video if I don't recycle. The Do video. you? He's like, I, I don't, I don't hate the clue steal, and I think that it's hard that Aberg, no. Aberg is on IR because it's hard to yeah. evaluate him. Yeah. However, do you think, given how popular he is? Among the the Gopher contingent, right of the the Wild Clues? fan base, yeah, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, Clues on the loose. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that he knee jerk reaction was like, "Well, I got to keep a Minnesota guy, so we'll we'll, we'll keep the backup goalie." God, I hope not. <laughs> I mean, I feel like there's part of that. Yeah, well, well, if, if that's yeah. the case, someone should tell Fenton a little fact about Zach Parise. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, is he from here? <laughs> yeah, he's he's not going anywhere either. Yeah, I mean, I that's the only reason why I was like, because remember the press release was like. The first thing he started out with was like, people like him and he's from here. And we were like, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, that, I mean, that's not a great deal. And that going back to the coil and any of these trades, I think come under the, the guise of, if you're not going to win, 
then who cares if you have an all left-handed team? You know, that team will actually sure. lose more. Sure. And and being the first one out of the playoffs and the last, you know, it almost doesn't matter. I, I just think it, it they're they're you got to be very careful with what they're doing cuz I think a full on like tear it down radio host calling for tank is tough with pseudo it, crazy. Well, it's really hard to do. Yeah. And and yeah. it's probably not going to be all that effective. Yeah. I mean, we've seen, I mean, we're they're going to be the next version of oil change that goes you, on for 20 years, you how, know. How about this with coil? And I I'd ask this that's hilarious. Uh <laughs> Oil change has been an unnoticed constant three on more this seasons, podcast. I think. I'm gonna, I'll let you guys it. go. I'll let you guys go. Is this <laughs> is this uh, uh, among things on TV? Where does this rank for you, Giles? Oil change. Oh, that's must see television. <laughs> yeah, it's like Game of Thrones. I oil just, change. Yeah, the, the Shirelli seasons were great. Like that was like when Conan was a writer for The Simpsons, and it was really really funny. That's yeah. like what the Shirelli seasons are for oil change. I, I just, uh, it, we can get into Spurgeon, you can get into Cranlin, Coyle, stuff like that. I, Coyle may leave because he wants to change his scenery. Sure. I mean, that that's the other thing you have to Probably consider with all this. I, I don't know why you'd want to be in that locker room right now. I just, we know that there was that turmoil with Yo, and I, I don't know if it's been that bad. I mean, I want to, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, that's a different story that's altogether. What they should do. That's but what um, all um, these players should do. If they don't want to be on the team, they should become bloggers. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You see Granlin posted on zone coverage and, and uh, Spurgeon, right? Yeah, Jesus. Yeah. Um, Spurgeon starts writing for Hockey Wilderness. Oh. Yeah. No, I think it's uh, – I, I just – I don't know if these guys are going to want to be part of it. I think Preezy and Suter are locked into it, for better or worse. Oh, yeah. I, it, it was funny when, when uh, um, Russo was asked about that. You know, he kind of shied away from that question after writing that huge oral oral history. I think it was maybe even sooner. Oh, sure. One of the one of the, you know, he was like, "Do you think these guys regret that decision? Given that this was such a big win for the Wild at the time, it was yeah. like they they took these guys away from the Red Wings and the Flyers and a New right. Jersey team that had just been to the Stanley Cup Finals, right? And it seemed like the dawn of a new era. And what we're seeing is it's just Minnesota sports again. It's it's the Saunders Wolves. It's the Twins that couldn't get past the Yankees. It's you know I yeah. mean it, the Vikings maybe are the breakthrough, but they they tend to just lose in a more dramatic fashion, yeah. right? I mean I think it you know to me that it seemed like they really bought into that, and it seems like they just have to be real with themselves and go forget the playoff streak, forget the loyalty of these guys who could leave you and may not be loyal to you anyways, and. It comes back to I think that's why you can move Coyle and Granlin and Spurgeon. Anyone who's not locked into a contract doesn't have player control or yeah. team control. Yeah, going forward, I would agree. This is, I don't know. It's it's weird. Like, and you hear all the names get thrown out there, and there's one that I don't think we've really talked about, and you know, doesn't really need to warrant a discussion. But Greg Pattern's name is out there. And, and he has two more years left. Yeah. Why? Who signed him to that contract? <laughs> now you're trying to get rid of him. Ooh, you brought in Anthony Batetto. Great. Two, two, two Brad honest, Hunt. Two, oh, two, two honest winger questions. Winger Brad Hunt. <laughs> two honest questions for you guys. How many players do you think get moved at the deadline? Uh, not as many as people think. No. Two? Two. Yeah. Two. yeah two. I'd, 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 I'd honestly be a little surprised if it was how many? How many of Spurgeon, Granlin, Stahl, Coyle, I guess if you want to throw Dubnik in there, how many of those guys are gone at the beginning of next season? So this is a trade that can happen no, at the deadline. F- uh, fair more, I would say. I'd, I'd I'd say one of those guys gets dealt. I think Stahl gets dealt. I don't think any the other deadline. guys get dealt the deadline. This summer, I mean, it, who knows? Do you knows? think that could be cleared out? Um, I don't know. I, I, think that the, I think that any one of those guys, uh, especially all the guys with only a year left, I yeah. think they're all kind of primed to get dealt this summer. Same for you, Jess. See, I would think so, but I am also a fan of the NHL, and I've watched many off seasons come and go with so <laughs> few effing trades because yeah, it's hard. This to is do. what the you cap hear. Is restricted. This is what you hear from the hockey and said, "Oh, the trade deadline's going to be going to be so full of deals. Everyone's looking to move. Three moves happen." It's oh, the opposite of the after, NBA where it the seems like later, they're playing yeah. pickup basketball. Yeah. yeah. Waj is tweeting out a trade every five <laughs> minutes. Meanwhile, the NHL has a trade every five years. And then the insiders after the trade deadline go, well, not a lot of moves happen, but a lot of great discussion, and they'll pick up again in the offseason. It'll yeah. be a lot of trades. Sure. Well, then the offseason comes around, and between the time the Stanley Cup ends and July 1st, there's like five trades. 
nothing really happens. Yeah. And then everyone goes to their cottage in New Brunswick for <laughs> the next two months, and nobody gives a damn about it anymore. So I have a lot of reservations about a lot of players being moved, but hey, maybe Paul Fenton can change that. But the NHL is a copycat league, so I have doubts. You know what ha- uh, needs to happen? Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Tony. Uh, I was just going to say that I, I think what hurts Minnesota too, in terms of like, maybe you want to move uh, some of those big guys, but I think what kind of hurts Minnesota in this regard is this isn't one of those trade deadlines because obviously the wild aren't the favorites. So of course it's not one of those years uh, where, uh, where your best forward on the market is Marty Hansel, right? <laughs> you have Artemi Panarin, you have Matt Duchesne, you have uh, Mark Stone uh, really getting the headlines there. So like, yeah, you could probably in an ideal world, you would probably move Mikhail Gramlin. You'd probably move Charlie Coyle, uh, Eric Stahl. Um, I, I believe I said, OK, I did not say Eric Stahl yet. Um, so you would move those guys at the deadline ideally. But I, I think maybe there there's a uh, there is a musical chairs element to this trade deadline where there are more big name forwards, more impact forwards on the market than uh then there are teams looking for them. Yeah. So that might uh, that might be another reason why the bigger moves happen at the draft. And Ben, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was I, I would just had a quip where uh, you know I think what needs to happen in order for to to kind of grease the skids a little bit to get some trades happening in NHL. Peter Shirelli needs a job. Uh, he needs to get hired <laughs> as a GM of another hockey franchise again. Just the wild. No, no. <laughs> uh, well, you might as well. I, I mean, what the hell? Fenton's right hand man. The hell's the difference at this point? Uh, <laughs> no, he needs to be a GM again. We need to have some fun in the NHL. I think the NHL should try to get him hired just for entertainment. Sake. But Seattle, they designate him as <laughs> Seattle <guess>. GM. <laughs> They're gonna name him oh, right no. now. The yeah. Seattle Chiarellis. <laughs> Yikes! I would, I would buy a Seattle Chiarellis jersey day one. <laughs> Do you, Tony, are you on board with these guys? Do you think this is going to look mostly like the same team going into next season? I don't think so. Cause I think that there is like, if, if they do decide and maybe, uh, maybe Craig Leopold's given uh, Fenton the, the green light to do whatever he wants. Cause he's just like really bummed out. And then like when it gets closer to the summer and, and like you have, uh, you have the possibility of going out and getting free agents, maybe his tune changes about the direction of the franchise. I, I think that might be something that's at play a little bit, but I think that if, um, I think that if they decide to go into this direction, uh, then I, I don't see why you want to have Spurgeon on for one more year and then try to resign him. I don't know why you want to try to resign Eric Stahl to, to a contract that he will deserve, but will also probably be like, uh, too old, too much money for what the Minnesota Wild need to do. Like, yeah. why hold on to the last year of Mikhail Gramlin, Charlie Coyle? So, I hope it doesn't look like the same team because I, like I said, like I, I, I'm, I'm very like, I'm very sports radio. Burn it down. Right now. <laughs> He's like, sitting there like well, holding the Molotov yeah. as he speaks to us. <laughs> so my, my issue with not issue with that, but my concern about that is, what what do you think about? the Kirill Kaprizov situation then? Cause I I'm thinking, you know, my train of thought is you don't burn it down because you just kind of have to tread water for two years. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody wants to do that. Um, but I, I think you keep some young players around just well, for I, the sake that you don't want this team to be a complete. And I mean, complete dumpster fire when Kaprizov potentially could show up because that could be a very good reason why he wouldn't. Right. Right. But I guess burn it down can mean two things. Burn it down can mean, burn it down to get draft picks, which I don't think is smart. It can also mean literally just moving, like changing the age of the team. I mean, shifting yeah, from no, late twenties to early twenties. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I feel like that's what they should be doing right now is shifting from late twenties to that's, early twenties. That's 20s. more what I would be looking for. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. Let me, let me counter with this though. If Karel Kaprizov's watching a uh, hockey day in America today, oh, like God. what, oh, what no. in that, what in that wild team makes him want to show he t- up? He tells his agent like, years. What what's St. Louis? Yeah. He's on the phone right now to sign another extension with CSKA Moscow. Uh, Vladimir Tarasenko, I've heard of this man. He's like, I love playing yeah. with Cam Barker. Yeah. <laughs> Good God. Um, I said I wouldn't mention his name. I apologize. <laughs> Here's an honest question. I'm mostly doing this just to be a jerk. Is Krill Kap- Kaprasov, does he end up being a better player than Brock Besser? That's uh, rough. 
I, uh, I bet. I think his ceiling. The might tools be are there. Yeah, I think his different ceiling might players be too. Yeah. yeah, and that's fair. Hey, did you know the Wild drafted Jewel Erickson at <laughs> over Brock Besser? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I I get that. I guess my point is I want to be careful with what we think he's going to be. Oh, sure. I totally agree. I'd much rather surround him with players because he's 21. How yeah. old is he? He's 21 now. His age. And I know that the Prezi, Prezi and Suter are going to be like, wait, I thought this is what, you know, I didn't want to do this twice, right? Yeah. But to be fair, they don't get to choose. And yeah. if they don't like it, what are you going to do? They yeah. said they want to live here, you know, like – Suter's got his big compound in Wisconsin and preezy has got his nice mansion. They're not going anywhere. So who the hell cares what they think? They yeah. can put up a stink. It's two players in the locker room. Yeah. Right? And, and I think you just tell them, we got to do this because the NHL is young and it's fast. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, you have to sell hope on this team because this is starting to feel like the post sellout wild. I feel like we've seen this over and over. The Todd Richards era? I Right. Yeah. You're going to start to lose fans because people go to these games where they lose to the Devils and the Flyers, <laughs> blow leads. Anyone who went to that game against St. Louis oh, God. is going to be like, no way I'm going to come back. If, you have, if you're have, if you not a season ticket holder and don't haven't already paid for your seats. Right. And so to me, I think the, the, the overhaul is necessary. I see it as an age shift. And then getting that star player is going to be tough. And that was Chuck Fletcher's problem is that he went all in. He traded these second round picks where you can get a Zucker or a Greenway Yep. because he thought this was a Stanley cup winning team. There is no star player on this team. I'm sorry. I like Zach no, Breezy a I, lot. That's a He's a finisher. He's a great two way player. Yeah. He is not a, like a, a Crosby Ovechkin, a, no, not you not know, right. stamp coast or no. whatever. And Ryan Suter is a great two way or a great defenseman. But I, I just don't know, like, I, I don't, th I think you still need that scoring forward no matter how great your best defenseman is. Sure. But, but I think you can find, you, you don't necessarily have to get them with the first three picks in the draft. And this is a point that I think yeah. Tony's made a lot um, mm -hmm. throughout the years is that, you, you know, you can wait and roll the dice on a Vladimir Tarasenko at, what was he, pick 20? Mm -hmm. 15. Yeah. They could have had 15, 15 yeah. 16. Could have yeah. had 16. Him. Right. Yeah. And so it, it's, it's players like that. Brock Besser, great example. Um, you know, that's, it's just stuff like that, where I think that you could, you could maybe put that team together without doing the full on, you know, blowtorch tank. Well, and I mean, look at Karel Kaprizov, right? You have, yeah. uh, fifth you had him in the fifth round. Like it's, it's, you're, you're going to get, uh, you're going to be more likely to get higher end talent at the top of the draft, which is one of the reasons why. I am like, all right, like I'm totally fine tanking next year and trying to get some ping pong balls for Alex Lafreniere. Uh, but um, like, hmm, I, you don't necessarily need that. Like finishing uh, finishing with the 12th overall pick in, in the draft is obviously not going to be as good as finishing in the top three or whatever. But like, I, I bet you anything that there is a guy who goes number 12 or later in this year's draft that is going to be like, Oh man, how did everyone miss it? him? Like he's like, yeah, there's going to be a David Pasternak in this draft. You're right. Yeah, and I think so. the, I think the other thing is it seemed like Fletcher was very much, he believed in his system and that over the course of time, whatever plan he had would pan out and that he could be a little safe, right? That he could, in some ways he, it was risky to move the second rounders, but it's safe to take Eric Sinek. Cause it seemed like he yeah. was kind of that, like, he seemed as close to a sure thing as you could get at that point in the draft. I think Fenton who didn't do this, obviously drafting this defenseman who seems very yeah, yeah, bad, yeah. but, but well, like, that was, that was, that was the previous scouting staff too. Yeah. That's over. We're talking about a guy in Paul Fenton who picked, uh, Ely Tolvanen, who I'm pretty sure Minnesota would never have touched in a million years. Yeah. Like this, uh, this goal scoring KHL guy. Because he, um, he wasn't smart enough to get into college, so they were just – no, like No, and they – and that's the Toxic thing. waste to them. Yeah, and it just seems like you, you don't get Tarasenko because he's Russian. The, you could go back to like a Kopitar because yeah. you're like, who the hell is he playing Slovenia. against in Slovenia, yeah. right? <laughs> right. I, to me, I'd much rather look back at the draft and said – and to be fair, even in this last draft, they were pretty smart second round and down, right? Oh, yeah. That, I that, really yeah, like their second round. There was day, a lot yeah. of high-risk, high-reward yep. kind of players. If, yeah. they, if they replicate that – in the coming years, 
but just swing for the fences with their first round pick. I'd much rather see that than just adding bodies to a. That's yeah. I wrote that exact yes. article yes. the day before the draft this year. Yeah, and then they did. <laughs> even, then then instead of swinging for a home run, they yeah. literally struck out bunting yeah, uh, that's, yeah like bunt hit him in the yeah, face yeah they, yeah they they popped out with bunting yeah. instead of uh swinging for the fences yeah because i i think you just you you have to see if you can get one guy who could be a difference maker if it's kaprasov or it's someone you draft here soon right if the wild do go the route of they are gonna start you know kind of selling these guys off and you know, whether that's now or the off season they start moving these core pieces to kind of restock the cupboard, they're, you know, maybe add some more youthful players into the lineup. My biggest gripe with kind of how they should go about the next phase of the Minnesota Wild is when you have young players who uh, finally get their chance in the NHL and they show you something, give them that chance. Like Minutes. Today, I thought it was neat to see Luke Cunnan get bumped up to the Granlin parisi line because sure. he had been playing really well. Obviously, nothing went right today, so that line wasn't <laughs> overly special. But that's something the Wild haven't seen or haven't done. Like, really, in the Chuck Fletcher, now Paul Fenton era, is kids come up. They have to play in the bottom six, and it it's like, you know, nails on a chalkboard to get them to go any higher because there's roadblocks. Yeah. And well, Alex Tuck, we never knew what he was because he never really got above, you know, line three, you know, so they had to part with him in the expansion draft. How many times did Jason Zucker have to make the poor commute down I-35? I don't think I've made that many commutes down I-35. You know, they have to let the kids get the premium minutes at some point to see what they have and give them that chance to develop better. No, I would agree. And and you know, what's really frustrating with that is like, yeah, like, I I mean, Luke Cunning got his, uh, got his opportunity on on the top line for a little bit today and that's really good he got 18 minutes that's really great you look at someone ah oh, is there anyone else who's young and on the roster <laughs> who's been playing really well who's not getting an opportunity and that's Jewel Erickson Eck who is scoring goals and then they're still like oh, okay like what just keep putting it with Marcus Felino like I, I just want to put this in perspective for you guys like today Jewel Erickson Eck had 13 minutes and 37 seconds. Do you know ha- who had more minutes than him? Eric Alex Stalock had 59 minutes and 40 <laughs> seconds. That's almost four times. To- it's more than four times the minutes. <laughs> and they're giving these opportunities to Alex Stalock, and they're yeah. letting Jewel Erickson Eck go on for like less than 14 minutes. Are you kidding? And how many points did he have? Exactly. Uh, exactly as many. His stat line was two penalty minutes. <laughs> Yeah, I I I, I agree with, completely with the, with all of this sentiment. I think that was, you know, maybe ultimately what what really doomed Nino here was not getting enough minutes. And I know that you know Bruce is kind of the the one that's in charge of that. But uh, I, I just don't I don't I don't know I don't know what what else needs to happen. I think you need to get rid of all the veterans in order for the youth to get minutes. Like that's the the crappy reality of it is that Jules Eriksson-Eck isn't going to get eighty minutes a game until you trade Eric Stahl and Miko Koivu is out with an injury and. And he's literally the last center on the roster. Like that's that's pretty much what it's going to take. Yeah, there's something more exciting about that as well. Even if it's a player like Erickson Eck, where we already kind of know who he is. See, I don't. I don't. I'm not exactly sure that we do though. I think, I think or at least people have already judged him. Let's oh, put for it sure, yes, for sure. Yes, and and yes. I think to Tony's point, he's been great recently, but he's still kind of being punished for the sins of the first half of the season where he was pretty dreadful. Like, Tony, you did. Yeah, Tony wrote about this right, and you had this chart. Of who he played with. Oh, and yeah. And there's, like, God. the weird pre... He was with, like, Preezy and Coyle, maybe, for a little bit. But outs- may- I could be wrong. Tony, do you remember who was on that chart? Yeah, it was it's a lot of Marcus Felinos, <laughs> a lot yeah. of uh, Chris Stewart's. It's a lot yes. of Daniel oh. Winnick's. Daniel and then, Winnick. Like, and, then you, and then you have, uh, and, and then you have like, you know, Jordan Greenway come in. But the thing is, like, you know, like, I... I I, I don't understand why Bruce wants to put the rookies together. Right. At all. Because it's just, like... Uh, 
you know, like you've got veterans who can who can drive the play. You know, you've got skilled people around it who have their legs under them. And like, I don't know, I, I, I just want like I just want them to staple Erickson Eck to somebody with skill, with uh to some winger with talent, and just let him go. But I guess we're not doing that. I don't know I, why. I think it maybe defeats your point a little bit, but him and Cunnan looked great together. Yeah, well, you that's could throw true, a veteran on that but, line. Yeah, with them. but it take yeah. for them but, to get to that point. Right, no, no, but I, I think if, you know, the one time they did kind of put two rookies together for, I mean, God, it, it was a whopping week, but they, I think yeah. they did look good together. And then, yeah, instead of, you know, anchoring them with Marcus Foligno, maybe you do have those two with a Parisi or with a, a Granlin, God forbid, or, or, or Zucker. Or, or Zucker, yeah, Zucker. absolutely, absolutely. You'd think after watching Nino Niederreiter get traded and get put with skilled players and now lighting it up, they would have learned, hmm, maybe we should try putting these skilled players in our bottom six who can't get above there with other skilled players and see what happens. But, well, and it's just a shift nah. in mentality of, of we want to win now. We want to keep the playoff streak alive and going back to yeah. we want to build for the future. With, survival if, mode. If you're Fenton, especially with Fenton where he's got a – He's got to get a couple wins here. That'd be a that'd be a good way. I, one thing before I forget about it, because I can forget things occasionally. Bruce Boudreau, he said he, this is a playoff team. For him, we knew he was on the hot seat, given that a new GM tends to want their own coach. If you're Bruce Boudreau right now, I mean, what what do you say about him? He is, you know, I think he's had his successes here, but he hasn't been the breakthrough coach. Right, S- smaller winning percentage. Uh, or points percentage, I guess is what they call it in hockey, than in Anaheim and Washington. It's well, less talented team. Yeah. Less talented team <laughs> as well. I guess, what do you make of Boudreau in his position right now? It's really tough because, you know, you, you hate to judge the guy by his previous playoff failures and then, you know, basically putting this entire team on his shoulders, like saying, hey, take this very moderately talented team and work magic with it. Um, but that's kind of what we were expecting out of him. You know, we were expecting him to do that, and he kind of did a little bit, like, right? They were a 100-point team every year so far. As we were reminded of early today on Twitter, the <laughs> best team in wild history, Yeah, the 106-point 2016-17 team that got bounced in five games by a goaltender who has now turned into ass. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I to your point, I mean Bruce has one year debt left on his deal. I'd I'd be surprised to see him uh, extend that. For let sure. alone coaching next year, I think is damn near a coin flip. And and you know if if he goes, I I just kind of hope it's on his own terms. Um, I As just kind of walks out the building in the second period. And yeah, that score. would probably be the best way to do it, honestly. <laughs> um, but no, I just think he you know if if Fenton does decide to go with some kind of teardown any kind of rebuild, reload, whatever terminology you want to use. I, I hope that Bruce just says, you know what? That's not for me. Um, I'm not here for a rebuilding team. Uh, I maybe want, he wants more and more crack at an NHL gig. Maybe not. That's really up to him. I just hope that he doesn't get fired for, let's just say the sins of Chuck Fletcher or, or the sins of Paul Fenton at this point. Like, I just hope that he's not held responsible for any of this because because he's like you forced me to move coil. And you well, got, there's yeah, yeah. Stuff, stuff like that exactly, I mean, yeah. and and so I that's that's kind of all I really think about the whole Bruce thing. Like, I, I, I you know, is he the greatest coach you know to, to ever live? No, um, but uh, he may he be really, as a man who speaks. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I also don't think he's gotten really a super fair shake here either. Yeah. Well, I, I. I... When it comes to Bruce, what I, I sort of think is when you look at this team, and, and I, I think Bruce is right. I think this is a playoff team, or at least it was before, you know, uh, Miko Koivu got hurt and, you know, Niederreiter got traded, right? Matt um, Dumba got this hurt, yeah. is a playoff team. If you look at the underlying numbers on this team, they are pretty strong. They're, they're, is, they're a stronger Corsi team than they've been uh, under the uh, Boudreaux era and probably for uh, for all but like one year of the Mikeo era, sure. um, their expected goals percentage is still extremely high. What is different is that they are getting absolutely submarined by awful goaltending right now. And I, I do like that is the sad thing for me is it's not that uh, Bruce Boudreaux's system isn't working. I, I think it is working in terms of just like, 
it's geared up to get Dubnik to face these quality, this quality of shots. And he is facing that. He's just not holding up his end of the bargain at all. And uh, whether that's um, whether that's age, whether that's the miles on him, uh, whether it's not like uh, having, you know, any anybody, anybody at all to step in behind him. Uh, it's probably a combination of all that. And oh, my God, I'm so I was ranting about it on Twitter today. Just how angry I am that like this we we I think we touched on it just a little bit earlier, but we had a clear need for a backup ever since Dubnik came here because uh, and the, because the reason why was because when we got Dubnik here, we had absolutely nobody. And ever since it's just been like, okay, like what minimum salary person can we plug in behind uh, Dubnik yeah. uh, to, uh, to just make sure that he doesn't have to start 80 games. And like th- there have been options. I, I think uh, three of the top 10 people, according to hockey reference and goals saved above average, I think it's uh, I think it's Yaroslav Halak, Robin Lehner, and um, oh man, there's one more. Who's uh, Anton Kudobin? Probably. Um, yeah. Each of the each of those guys could have been had this off season and had for less than three million dollars, but they decided to the absolutely Hamburg pass on that and <laughs> keep rolling with. Oh, no, you're right. They got Andrew Hammond for the league minimum after putting up like a 900 save percentage in the AHL. So, yeah, I, uh, uh, everything about that just makes me very angry. And again, I am ranting. I will give up the floor. No, I, I absolutely agree. And I think what maybe what Dubnik is missing and maybe what he's missing right now is that second goaltender. I mean, we've, we saw it how many times? We saw it with Manny Fernandez and Dwayne Rolls. And we yeah. saw it with Nicholas Backstrom and Josh Harding. You could say Kemper. And, yeah, yeah. Kemper had stretches, yeah. And so you, it, it's so advantageous to have a guy that can push your number one guy. And also you can have a guy who's going to do something besides start the tail end of a back-to-back. Like, you need to have – I think that that's something that's so underrated in the NHL and makes the Staylock signing even more frustrating. I'm trying not to bring that up every five minutes, how much it pisses me off. But I, I th- it, It's worth bringing up because a lot of these things, people are going to say hockey's random, right? Bad balances, that it's a small sure. salary cap, that it's really hard because it seems like you really want to rely on young players or – kind of the Koivu veterans, right? But the Koivu veterans can get hurt or hit a wall, and the young players are just volatile. But these, there's a reason why this team is not good. And again, going back to the Boudreau point, he may be right that it's a, a playoff team, but are you Florida Gulf Coast or are you <laughs> Kansas, right? They look like, and, and I think that's, I don't even know if the playoffs should save his job. And that, this is coming from someone who likes Boudreau, knows his track record, is probably the most entertaining thing about the wild right now. The he fact was, that he almost threw an Effenheimer on oh, the that was NBC awesome. broadcast. That was I mean, so awesome. he's the most entertaining thing about the wild right now, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think, I mean, like I said, I think it doesn't matter because love him or hate him. And I, Ben, you we talked about your piece before you jumped on. I think it was really well written. It's a good kind of thought experiment. We may not trust Ben, but this is who it, who the wild have. This is what it is. And, and, and He's got to recreate it in the image he wants. And I think that if I'm the ownership, right, if I'm Leopold, I say act fast because I need to know if you're my guy, if you can kind of pull this off because right now there's a handful of strikes against you, whether yeah. it's the smaller stuff, the stay locked pattern contracts or the Nino trades, something yeah. like that. So I did uh, some research, shocking, I know, for this podcast. <laughs> but <laughs> This is not on our brand, Joe. Yeah, since... February 1st, which is, you know, it's a smaller sample size, but I started, yes. I filtered out the um basically the goaltenders who play the bulk of the minutes for their respective teams. And if you look at the 5 on 5 save percentage, Devin Dubnik's 898. This is well, he didn't play today, so it therefore doesn't You're matter, fine. but um out of the 28 goaltenders who I had qualified under the minimum minutes amount of played, Devin Dubnik's 898 save percentage at 5 on 5 is tied for 24th out of those 28 goaltenders. Sounds about right. And Hell yeah, King. It, <laughs> uh, and it, it just gets even even worse. Like, I don't know. I didn't even bother to look at Al Stalock's numbers. It just numbers. get worse. 
don't. It absolutely gets worse. Like there are goalies that can't stop a beach ball, right? Yeah. And then like today you had Staylock. Like Nick Sealer, six five Nick Sealer was sliding into the net with the puck, and Alex Staylock couldn't stop a six five guy from getting. <laughs> <laughs> I switched over, and I'm not even joking about this from the the wild game to sports center. So one channel up yeah. and immediately it was someone making a joke about sealer. And I was like, these guys don't even know what hockey is. Yeah. And they know that someone did something wrong. Yeah. <laughs> that play. Yeah. yeah. It was brutal. Yeah. He literally couldn't stop a sliding defenseman, let alone the puck. Yeah. Brutal. And then he took the puck into the trapezoid. <laughs> yeah. Go uh, I know Stalock's five on five save percentage this year has been worse than Devin Dubnik. And, and that's, you know, that's a huge problem when, when you're starting goalie has in a sub 900 save percentage over the last three months. The last thing you want to hear is that there's a goalie controversy. Yeah. Well, and that's just it. And that's something that I've maybe tried to squash a little bit too hard, but there really is, shouldn't be a goalie controversy like that, that, and, and don't get me wrong. This isn't me being a Dubnik apologist and saying that he's fantastic and should, you know, be unquestionable. That's how bad Alex Dalek is to me. <laughs> like yeah, that's, if you had, if that's you had how bad anyone that you felt even kind of comfortable with. And I'm so sorry for interrupting. No, no, uh, no. Yeah, you're right. But uh, if you had anybody who you could even feel comfortable starting like four games in a row like, while Dubnik got his head right, like this would not be a goalie controversy. Right. At all. Absolutely. And it goes back to I think you should have a, you know, a better backup than this. Like that's. That's the thing, you know, the whole Stalock thing that, that gets me the most is that you it's not hard to find a good backup goaltender. They're literally on the market every summer, every summer. And the, it's, it's kind of one of those weird economical things with the NHL where backup goaltenders don't make a whole lot and they don't get long contracts. But use it oh, to your favor. You're not supposed to sign them to a long contract. Well, and, and well that's, that's, just, and the, and that's, that's, that's the, just it. This is the BS part that I don't I don't buy it. I'm sorry. Like. The company line that was coming out after Stalock signed the extension was, well, they're getting ready for the expansion draft. They want to have oh, protection. God. It's F like that. That's the most BS thing you could say. Like, you have another two years where you can fix that problem. Like, why do you anchor yourself to somebody who is a below average backup goaltender? And Peter Shrell is not even looking You can sign <laughs> literally anybody. Right. You can sign you someone sign the day a before. Man off the street. They did that with Vegas. They signed Stalock. And like yeah, that was that was the, how they acquired. That's him. exactly yeah. That's exactly how that happened. They signed Stalock to an NHL deal. Like well, I think it was as as soon as they could that that season. It was midway through that season before the Vegas draft. It was You've got two years. It was in that time when they. I think it was in that time when they called him up for like those two starts yes. because whoever the backup was Kemper was Kemper, having a brutal year. He was not doing it. And Dubnik just Bruce literally said he needs days off. Right, because Dubnik was having a brutal month. Right, that was the month of March where Dubnik went from Vesna that was favorite where, to not even on the. That ballot. was where the Wild went from sure thing division winner to second, and yep. you now have to play the Blues. Yep, which shouldn't have been a problem, but well, I mean, <laughs> details, yeah, yeah, details, yeah. Tom. Yeah, and Do you. I, uh, Go ahead, Tom. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, Stalock's there. And, and I know we should probably stop talking about it. Stalock's there, too, if you just, if you hadn't signed the him. The buyout isn't that bad, Tom. Yeah. No, and, and who knows? <laughs> it's going to be a funny conversation if you have to just go buy out all these contracts that he signed this summer. But uh, the point is, is that you could you could test the waters and that he's probably the, just kind of the the floor, essentially, for <laughs> I, I think you can send him. I think honestly, you can send him down to the AHL. Yeah. Who the hell's going to claim him on waivers? And then Nobody. you sure. that that does you do have a little bit of a cap hit with that, but it does bury, I believe, most of the money depending on the structure of his contract. And that's it worth saying. Yeah. Right. Do you remember? Do you guys, oh, go ahead. Do you guys want a football to the groin here, like a real kicker to this? What's that? <laughs> All right, Darcy Kemper has a higher save percentage than Devin Dubnik this year. Oh, I know, I believe, I totally believe. Man that. getting hit by football. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> just... <laughs> <laughs> Such a good episode. So this is funny. Remember a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, we had the segment where we tried to make like a wild themed whiskey. Yes, because it was for the the whiskey Zach and Parisi cheese. Whiskey and wine night. Yeah, whiskey and wine. Yeah. That nice. was tonight. 
<laughs> After oh. the game. Oh, can you imagine? They're like, uh, <laughs> uh, we're, we're, we're out. And they're like, oh, we're 10 minutes into the event, guys. Yeah. Uh, we'll we'll the get a game keg. Ends, yeah. Their guests are just inebriated oh because God. they consumed you, all the whiskey. Do you remember wine. when I. Uh, <laughs> So I think, and I believe that this is the first Prezi Suter year where they were like cratering, 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 and they had at home a an event where they had like go out and sign a jersey and give it to a kid or whatever. I don't know why I remember this, but I remember Miko Koivu coming out and looking like literally he had no blood in his body. <laughs> like he was pale white and like handing the kid the jersey. And you could tell the kid was kind of like, I want to go home. This team sucks. <laughs> Well, it, it was because it was an awkward moment because Miko realized the kid he handed to it was his. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just a... Uh, um, That's a bit that needs more play. Uh, it, it's, yeah, I mean, there, there's there's something about this team that you can, and they, you know, they just, it's Groundhog's Day. Oh, <laughs> you just see the whole same thing over and over again. And, and that, you know, that's the strongest argument for the the gutting. All right, so before we uh, fire around the table here and do, like, a kind of a trade deadline, maybe, like, prediction, mm -hmm. uh, little little tidbit of news from uh, the great uh, Russo, as uh, it sounds like Mike Madano, former North Star, inching his way closer to some kind of position within the Wild organization. What? They, uh, they, what? Brought, they you know broke what? out the big guns after <laughs> this loss. Next coach. Yeah. He just wants Shake. to be a fourth line center again. That's what this is all about. He's, he's like, Eric Fair, trade one, him. I'm put me in. One more go in the NHL. That's what he's angling for here. Oh, that's really gonna get the the North why, Stars. Why folks is out he of. here? Like, yeah, he played here for what? He, three years? Uh, he's been watching games of the wild this year and he was in the press box today next to Tom Curvers. Curvers was actually on TV and you could see the arm of somebody sitting next to him. Apparently the camera did not feel to pan over <laughs> to Mike Madano so on ridiculous. Hockey Day in America. For, yeah. Mike, Mike Madano, by the Arguably way, the best American player to ever play. Yeah. Mike Madano hockey reference is great because it's 19 to 40. He played in the NHL and he played the first four years for the North Stars, Dallas, 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 and then Detroit. For yeah. His final year. Uh, yeah. That final year in Detroit. It was really? like when Brodeur was doing like enterprise commercials in the, in the, St. Louis Blues jersey. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah, something happened there. Yeah, less, yeah, <laughs> it's a less. bad blood with New Jersey. Yeah. yeah. Do you think if we try to get Madano on, we can get a Mooderous jersey? Oh, that would be great. <laughs> and burn it. That poor bastard had to wear that. Yeah, he did. Yuck. We should talk to him about it. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, kind of fire around the room here and and Tony as well. Um, just uh, what, just make a prediction on what happens with the wild before the, the trade deadline. Uh, and I'll start with Tom Stalin Spurgeon gone Spurgeon. Oh, wow. Blown it up. Wow. Okay. Uh, I, I would just go stall. And I, I, I think yeah, maybe this is just wishful thinking on my part because again, as I kind of wrote, I, I you, you can't really trust Fenton at this point. Like he, every move he's made is kind of spectacularly blown up in his face already. Um, so yeah, I, I, I stall and and you just kind of hope that that's enough of a learning experience for him to carry into this summer if he is going to uh, dismantle or reload this team that, that you know that he doesn't do anything foolish. So I'm gonna go with just stall. Actually, I'll say stall and he'll probably give away fair for you know a box of pucks or something. But because um, why not? But I think they make two deals: one big, one little. I think it's going to be Stahl and Coil, just because I think that those are going to be uh, the easiest contracts to move, just because they are so low. Sure. Um, and I think uh, I think in the summer is maybe when you look at uh, when you look at trading someone like Gramlin, when you look at trading someone like Spurgeon. I think you can do that at the draft. Sure. I think I think that's reasonable. It's worth pointing out. Um, I didn't know this until I read Tony's piece that San Jose gave up a seventh rounder for Fair last year. Maybe he has some value. It's like I said, box yeah. of pucks. Yeah. I mean, Brian Boyle got a second round pick, so I mean, there's always value in. <laughs> there's always one dumb GM. You just gotta find him. 
God, why did Shirelli get fired? Damn David, it. David Poyle <laughs> felt like... the need to trade for Cody McLeod, who I thought was not in hockey anymore. But... <laughs> did he trade for did he trade for him from a Swiss league or where did he get him from? I, I, don't even... I forget where. Yeah. I think it was the Can you Rangers? imagine someone's like, uh, call Shirelli. He's not in the league anymore. Okay, oh, Fenton, Fenton. Yeah, call yeah. Fenton real quick. <laughs> Carolina has his number. No, if you need it. I think Bergevin's the next go-to. <laughs> I'm pretty I was going to sure. say, Coyle's a pretty good uh good guess because i think the canadians might circle the tires on coil again they've been yeah. interested in him for how long and the canadians are very sneakily good this year they just keep waiting yeah. for him to learn how to speak french that's what they're yeah. waiting for he hasn't learned how to speak french yet so they're just not ready to make that move <laughs> he's somebody, gotta get that rosetta so. yeah i was just gonna say somebody just keeps suspiciously sending him rosetta stone french boxes <laughs> And like Mark Mark, Mark Bergevin and Charlie Quell are both workout freaks. They could probably bond over that. Oh yeah, <laughs> some protein powder together. Uh, I will. Uh, I'll say Stahl um, will be the only one to go. I think that's just the the easiest. And I I want to say Granlin, but I just that's a really that's just a sell low, and I just don't think you can do that at this point. So, um, what do y'all think about Felino? Got uh, moving at the at the deadline. Uh, I think it's tough because I, I think he's got two years left on that deal, and it's not like it's a super super cheap deal for what he brings. I I think you would almost have to give him away, which I'm totally fine with. I, I'm I'm no I'm kind cap of, space has some value. Yeah, I'm I'm not the world's biggest Marcus Foligno fan though. So. I'm super bummed. I've wasted almost two years without putting a Northern exposure soundtrack <laughs> next to Marcus Foligno whenever he gets discussed. Like I hit me today and I tweeted that at you. I wasn't sure if you got that or not. Oh, I definitely got it. Yeah. Okay. Cause the, the intro to Northern exposure is just a moose wandering the streets yeah. of a small Alaska town. Can I, can I throw a Jersey hot take out there? <laughs> sure. To finish? Oh. Tom it's not quickly, even a hot take. This is a highly reasonable. Tom quickly bringing us into jerseys. This Sorry. Is... Did, did we, do we want to, we have any more trades? I'm, so? I know, but we can very quickly hit on jerseys for this. Well, week. Our, our topic is stadium series, yeah. which there's only one, so we can. Talk so about before that this, just because it this sure. is relevant to today, I think the NHL. First of all, they could learn something from the NBA that you can have a a lighter jersey and a darker jersey, like a red jersey and a black jersey on the court at the same time, and the players know which guy's on their team. What a concept. Um, and you have some dynamic Incredible. looks. I don't know if you, uh, you guys probably don't watch the NBA much, but like you have a dynamic look between the two teams. Sure. The the rule they need to implement is that you can't have yellow and white together because the Penguins yes. yellow and the Rangers white did not work. Nashville has to stop looking like a roller hockey team, especially when they had a cool blue jersey, the alternate, right? which they could be using as their standard jersey. But beyond all else... Why is why are they cruising around in the yellow jerseys when the other team's in the white? That just makes no sense. It's, to me. it's an eyesore. Yeah. And I, I just maybe that's not a hot take. Maybe that's just reasonable. But how the NHL hasn't figured that out? That was like I was I should be entertained by a New York Pittsburgh game that was like an eleven goal game. But the whole time I'm like, why why is this garbage happening? Like why why are you Yo, doing I, this I NHL? One hundred percent agreed. It looks awful. I think. I, and you know if if I'm have any kind of pull, I tell Nashville basically retire your white jerseys. Yeah, just wear yeah, yellow yeah. and then allow whatever visiting team to wear their color jerseys in Nashville. And Pittsburgh could have an alternate away jersey, essentially, with the yellows. Yeah, well, they're the only other team with a yellow jersey. And, well, for obvious reasons. Right, exactly. Yeah. They don't need to, you know, yeah, they don't need to use yeah. it against white. But Nashville had those cool cool blue ones. Oh, they, I, know, yeah. I agree. Yeah. I, I made a, a blue jersey for their third jersey. Yeah, that's right. In the article, this yeah. well, I basically just used Microsoft Paint and yeah. filled in their white jersey yeah. with navy. I thought it looked great, actually. <laughs> yeah. All right, so very quickly, Jersey of the Week is Stadium Series. Yeah, got the uh, uh, the Battle of Pennsylvania for the 17th time. Do you have some uh, best and worst Stadium Series jerseys? I do think they did a decent job this year, actually. I'm not, like, huge on these jerseys. I don't think they're super awesome. But the two-tone look, I think, kind of works a little bit. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it's not bad um, because... Let's be honest, the, the history of Stadium Series jerseys isn't very good. No, it's I terrible. think the Wild did a pretty decent job, and the Blackhawks Yeah, I thought the Wilds were good. I thought the Wilds were pretty good, but otherwise, I mean, Stadium Series jerseys have been kind of like, What bad. about the powder blue um, Pittsburgh ones? 
Was it a stadium series or a that was a oh classic. that might have been winter oh classic. Cause, yeah. cause that, so is that the Capitals too? Because I like the Capitals. Yeah, yeah yep. shoot. Uh, <laughs> but like the the Avs, they their new third jerseys essentially yes. debuted as a stadium series jersey. They made some tweaks to it. Did, I, did I bring up my baseball take on on those Avs jerseys? The no. blue ones. That should be the Rockies uniforms. I hate the Rockies uniforms. And I think the rock because you know that the the they can't jer- wear hockey jerseys, Tom. No, nah, they can wear the color scheme because <laughs> <it, 'cause laughs> sure. you could do the C as the. I guess maybe it's too close to the Cubs. We could do the C from the flag as the hat. Yeah. And then I just think that color scheme would look better than purple. I love that. I wish the Avalanche. Or I'm glad the Avalanche has. Had I really like. That. I do really. I do like yeah. that. Yeah. There was. There's. Uh, the Stadium Series history is too much chrome to it. Yes. <laughs> well, that was Stadium Series was when the Kings wore white pants. As well, and that was just looked like did, did giant not, adult diapers. It was pretty hilarious. I actually. think like the gold. I think the golden seals did <laughs> Which that. Which is perfect for people like Drew Doughty and Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, didn't the the Oakland Seals or something? They had white breathers and they white, were white skates and white skates, and yeah. and they weren't white leather. They were painted with paint. Yeah, that sounds and about like right. so by the end of the season, after all the nicks and cuts on the yeah. on the paint, their skates were like twenty five pounds a piece because they were just like covered in household lacquer. Woof. Yeah, so I I mean you had the stadium series in like 2013, 14 in that area when it was, you know, remember New York, New York and New Jersey had that like three-way series at Yankee yeah. Stadium. That sounded terrible, <laughs> but um, Diggity. And then the uh, I think it was like the next year you had the Ducks and the Kings who played at Dodger Stadium, which yep. I thought was actually pretty neat. Kind of cool, yeah. The jerseys were not great. Awful. The Ducks were wearing the orange, all orange that's where the Ducks that have good damned in the all orange jerseys started yep. was right there yep. with An- oh, absolutely Anaheim. They won me back, but then they're killing me with jerseys. <laughs> um, Are, were you the guys who said that uh, Vancouver should change their color scheme? I said that. Yeah, yeah, I love that idea. Going back, to there was a lot of things said on this black, podcast. Black, red, and orange, and yellow. Y- yeah. yeah, I think they, I think you rolled out in the stadium series to kind of try that out, like or whatever the Heritage Classic, whatever they call it. They're before. they're using the flying skate on occasion this year, not even for a special. I, I no, next year. I think that's their color they're scheme. They're not wearing. They already wore it this year. I thought they did. Um, I haven't seen uh, it. At least one game I thought they did. Mm. I could be wrong. I, but They said it was I, coming back. I, I think, think they need to go back to that scheme because their jersey is one of the yikes in hockey. And, yeah. um, and I love the Seattle Mets using that. <laughs> and they are going to be the Seattle Mets using that as their their main color to kind of – kind of like Pittsburgh. You get the same yeah, color across. Same color, yeah. And then you had – you know, like you said, the Wild, they did reasonably well. The Blackhawks yep. was just some iteration of their uniform was history. Very different than their regular Then you had the, the Penguins, who basically uh, their third jersey now is what they wore a few years ago. And, That's uh, right. It was all yellow. Um, yeah, it just, I don't Stadium Series jerseys haven't been good in the most part, and so therefore we can probably just say it, most of them are bad and mm-hmm. call it a show. I, liked, I like the Pittsburgh all yellow ones. Those were pretty cool. Um, I like the one Detroit wore. Oh yeah, that's I don't, right. I don't know if is that a winter classic though. They uh, well they no, won no. a stadium series against Colorado. Oh, that's right. That's right. You're right. Yep. Uh, I I kind of like the diagonal stripe. That seems kind of fresh to me. Uh, so like there's some uh there's some uh ones that are like interesting that I'm like oh that looks fly. But on the whole, I I agree with you. It's pretty underwhelming. Yeah. Bring back yeah. bolts and sends. <laughs> oh, all right if either um, of those teams ever got a stadium series so help me god yeah any any last thoughts from everyone before we uh we call it a show we've uh we've gone well beyond our our hour mark that's okay tom's here he can he can i'm it. upset with myself <laughs> yeah you kept changing the topics just kidding. I walked in. You're talking about college basketball, so I. I it was know. a good analogy. The Wild are Florida <laughs> Gulf Coast. Uh, yeah. Any the uh, Richmond Spiders. Okay. Oh final thoughts. Somebody. Oh, that was my final thought. Okay, that's Tom. <laughs> Tom has spoken. Boom. It's a good way to end. Uh, Tony, before we uh, we go, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at oh hi Tony, and then you can find um, my work at the Athletic Minnesota. Oh. I almost forgot on the jerseys. Do you have a Mount Rushmore you want to share? Because we have to ask. Sure, I can. I can roll that off right now. Um, um so I am. I'll, I'll make this as quick as possible. Uh, because I have it in front of me. Uh, Minnesota Wild Green alternates with the script. I love those. I want those back. Sure. 
Uh, Buffalo Sabres jerseys from the 80s, the uh, the blue and yellow. I like those. Those sure. are really nice. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm trying to find, or I was trying to find like a white jersey that I really liked. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'll go into college hockey. And like we said, some bad things about Alex Taylor. So I will give props to the uh, the UMD jerseys, the ones with the bulldog on uh, on white. That's uh, nice. that's real nice. I like those. And I, I, I think that everyone... I uh, can agree, like these defunct teams, right? You have these defunct teams that, you know, when they were there, when they were there and they had those beautiful jerseys and they existed, it just made the world so much better. <laughs> and for me, that team is the Soviet Union. <laughs> I own a jersey of the Soviet Union. I, I agree. That is baller. Did you guys see Don Cheadle wore Soviet Union jersey on Saturday Night Live last night? No. At yeah, the they got him. Yep. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, check that out. Um okay, so yeah, I don't I don't have necessarily a final thought that I haven't hit on already, I guess, but uh I don't know. I'm I'm just I will say as a final thought, I'm I'm wary of of the teardown. I'm wary of Paul Fenton blowing it up. Um I just I don't like the wild's odds with that of being a competing team anytime in the next 5 years especially uh if he does choose to pretty much dismantle this team. So that's why I'm kind of against it. So I'm hoping that he treads lightly at the deadline. Um, but I'm also hoping that he somehow becomes a very good GM overnight as well. So maybe I'm just, <laughs> maybe I'm just hoping and dreaming for too much. Um, also before we forget Giles, and I don't think we've even confirmed this, but if we will, we'll change our minds, but we have a booth cast uh, this month that we've kind of tentatively planned. So look, uh, look forward for that announcement sometime soon shooting for, February 26th against the Jets, but we will confirm that and we'll let you know on next week's show. Yeah. Thanks to, uh, thanks to Tom for uh, sitting in with us and, uh, doesn't feel sincere. Getting his, cool. getting his takes. <laughs> I, I was sincere. Someone had to fill to in Tom. for me with yeah. all the anger and vitriol before I got here. You came in here. Actually, piping hot. I actually, literally uh, piping hot. Actually, yes. Tony did a good job at the beginning of the show. Great. Of, That's good to hear. Uh, oh, you're going to listen to the first it. part yeah. and probably kill Tony. We've got the, <laughs> we've got the hello. We've got uh, marrying oh, nice. 90s jerseys. He uh, oh, yeah, awesome. there was a yawn coleslaw. Just oh man, <laughs> that's a bingo right there. That's I played the hits, man. That's what that hits. is. That's that's Ben's greatest hits. Oh yikes! That's that was the every old man's greatest band. hits. <laughs> <laughs> Yawning over coleslaw. Yeah. You're, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Uh, thank you to Eric for uh, producing this. Somehow getting through uh, this with us here. He's been watching the NBA All Star Game. Yeah, fine. yeah. Um, but yeah, that uh, that can do it for for this show. Uh, thank you again to Tony for uh, sitting in with us here and uh, venting about literally everything, including <laughs> college hoops. Uh, <laughs> you can find this otherwise fine production on Twitter at G A T G Wild Podcast. Ben and I are on Twitter at Ben Remington at Giles Farrell. Tom is on Twitter at tschreier3. He literally has the quickest retweets on any of my gifts. <laughs> I love him. I hit send. Half second later, Tom Schreier retweeted. That's How? never happened to me once. How? I don't ben, know. most years are like wrestling <laughs> related. Yeah, you say that like <laughs> it's a bad thing. <laughs> um, and then uh, you can find uh, Ben and I's uh, written work at zonecoverage.com slash wild. Got a lot of fun uh, trade deadline stuff coming out this week check that out uh find the show on itunes soundcloud iHeartRadio, spotify google play all that fun stuff drop us a review even if it's uh one star like uh, that egghead out there who uh hates all of our shows Boo. Otherwise so fine. uh is that you is that you no, giving us one? Okay. <laughs> um i'm hardly otherwise fine <laughs> same Fair. Yeah, that uh, can do it for this show, and we will talk to you again next week. Later. It's not resiliency. You're making it sound like we're good. That's all. I'm done. <laughs>